Good day to you wonderful folk in British Columbia. I have the privilege of being part of your equip and so I'd just like to thank you for that privilege to those that have invited me to be part of this. I trust you all well. I trust you're keeping safe. I trust you're keeping healthy and in the not too distant future hopefully we will be able to see one another face to face. I believe uh, I just recently read that the board is possibly opening up in a couple of weeks, which is wonderful, wonderful news. And uh, you guys certainly have had a, a tough time with some of the restrictions that have been put in you. They've been a lot stricter on you guys than they have on us, but I believe things are opening up for you. So that's wonderful news, wonderful news. Anyway, if you've got a Bible, it goes me to Titus, Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, and what I want to actually talk about today is cultivating an environment within your heart for the work of the Holy Spirit to work in you and to work through you. But I just want to lay a little bit of a brief foundation for that because everything we do in the kingdom, everything we do for the kingdom has to be by the Spirit of God. Anything that's going to last, anything that's going to be of any value has to be by the Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, however word you want to term it. And so we need to understand that we want to invite the continually, continue work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, through our lives. So there's a continual transformation taking place as we allow the Spirit of God to work through us. But Titus 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 11 says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. It's amazing it's the grace of God that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. The grace of God. It's not laws, it's not legalism. It's the grace of God that teaches us no. So, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. It's amazing, the Bible says, for unto us a child is born, but a son is given. And then in the New Testament, it talks six times where Jesus gave himself, and this is one of them, who gave himself to redeem us, who gave himself to purify us, who gave himself because of love, who gave himself to cleanse us, who gave himself to redeem us. And it's he that gave his life to us, that we might be come children of God. I love this passage of scripture. So, this always amazed me. It always has amazed me. It continues to amaze me. How God comes. He calls us when we are lost in our depraved state. He comes by His grace, His mercy, and His goodness, and His powerful love to rescue us, to redeem us out of the hold, out of the clutches of the devil, and to translate us into His kingdom. He calls us first to Himself, and then he puts destiny and purpose in us. Not just salvation. Destiny and purpose. In Jesus we are rescued from the dominion of darkness. And then God enables us to take hold of this abundant life. That's all the promises he has for you and me. Not only just to forgive us from sin, but to deliver us from the power of sin. And that we'll be able to walk in all that he has for us. God's way of doing things is altogether different from man's way. Man's way is to try and suppress sin by seeking to overcome it. God's way is to remove sin. God pulls us out of the river of sin and then he gets the river of sin out of us. The real purpose of becoming a Christian is not so much to save ourselves from hell and go to heaven, but to become a child of God allowing the Father through the Holy Spirit to form the character of Jesus within us so that the splendor of his glory and his goodness may be displayed 
to the world. But to live this life, it is impossible, impossible, without the workings of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God, we will not be able to do anything that will last in the kingdom. So when Jesus was on earth, towards the end of his ministry, in the last week of his ministry, in John 13, 14, 15, and 16, he gives this incredible teaching and insight on the coming of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm going away, but I'm going to send another. You folk know this. One is exactly like me in every way that will be with you forever. In other words, he's saying, the one that is coming will be, in a sense, me, but you cannot see me. It will be like I'm there, but you can no longer see me. And he is the Holy Spirit. He will come. In John 14, 16, the Bible says, The Father will give you another counselor. That word another means the same as in character in every way, to be with you forever. John 14, 17 says, And he will be with you, and he will be in you. Verse 26 says, He will teach you all things. He will remind you of all things. In chapter 15, 26 says, He will testify about me. He will bring conviction. He will guide you into all truth. He will speak not on his own, but only what he hears. Just as Jesus, when he walked on the face of the earth, said, I only do what I hear my Father tell me or what I see my Father doing. That's all I do. And the Holy Spirit will be exactly the same. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears. So, and then he will bring glory to me and he will tell you what is yet to come. You see, the Holy Spirit can come upon us in power and we're always trusting for that and we can experience that. But next week, it can wear off us because the power of God can come, but we don't really know who the Holy Spirit is. But when the person of the Holy Spirit comes and when we walk with him, and we know him, we will experience daily presence and power flowing from his personhood. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is God. And when we get a bit of theology and a bit of truth and walk with him, his power will rub off on us every day. Every day. And he will reveal Jesus. He will glorify Jesus. He will not give us a Bible study about Jesus or some, some help, self-help scheme or some psychology or some academic information from the Bible. He will give you the tangible, supernatural, living reality of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Truth is there to lead us to God and experience God, but not as a replacement for God. People can know the Bible back to front. They can know what the Bible says, but the question is, do they have the Holy Spirit? Do we have the one and know the one who will reveal the Word of God to us, make that Word life to us, and to reveal the supernaturalness of Jesus Christ? That's what it means to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And I just know in my own experience, my limited experience, just through my salvation, and what God did, and I came very quickly to understand that I could not walk this life, this Christian life that he wanted me to do, without the Holy Spirit. I tried, trust me. Uh, there were periods in my life where I was trying so hard, I just lost the joy of my salvation. My dear family used to call me the black cloud because, <laughs> but anyway, it was just a living, <laughs> learning experience for me. And because the Holy Spirit is always pointing us towards Jesus, much of our understanding of the Holy Spirit is indirectly from the fingerprints of His presence in creation in our lives. So the New Testament gives us terminology to describe Him. Wind, water, oil, fire, wine. And that's the activity of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say to you, live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. Galatians 5.25 says that since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You see, we are brought to life by the Holy Spirit. We are born again by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And when we're born again, He takes residence within our heart. We know that. 
and inside we cry ever father the spirit within us cries ever father with our spirit and so we're brought to life by the spirit and then we also learn to live this life here on earth by the spirit walking in the spirit being led by the spirit and we learn to sow to the spirit and that's where i actually want to go so galatians 6 7 and 8 in the nrb says this do not be deceived god cannot be mocked a man reaps what he sows if he sows to please his flesh from the flesh will reap destruction he ever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life the passion translation i love the way the passion translation puts it he says god will never be mocked for what you plant will always be the very thing you harvest the harvest you reap reveals the seed you planted if you plant corrupt seeds of self-life in this natural realm you can expect a harvest of corruption if you plant good seeds of spirit life you will reap beautiful fruits that grow from the everlasting life of the spirit <laughs> let me ask you a question you never see an apple tree or an orange tree or whatever tree trying very hard to produce apples or oranges you don't see the tree oh, going to produce an apple it just naturally grows and so when we walk with the Spirit, when we allow the Spirit to work in and through us, there's a transformation that continually takes place on a daily basis. And it's His work, it's His activity in and through our lives. The Bible gives us three, um, I want to say, warnings concerning the Spirit, the New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 12, Mark 3, and Luke 12, He said, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men but blasphemy against the holy spirit will not be forgiven and that blasphemy against what it means is abusive speech against it's wounding one's reputation by evil reports and evil speaking reviles or destroys another's good nature and so blasphemy is against the holy spirit what it does is it opposes the convicting power of the holy spirit that's why we can never be forgiven because we need the convicting power of the Spirit of God to bring conviction so we can repent, which is also a gift from God. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Paul says this, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. In other words, do not quench the Spirit, meaning don't stop the flow of the Spirit of God in and through our lives. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's to offend or insult or literally to limit His work. Because we can do that. We can limit His work. So, what can we do to cultivate an environment for the ongoing activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives and through our lives? Because... God sent His Son to us. We receive Him. Then He calls us to be with Him. That's a cultivation. That's a lifestyle of cultivating Jesus Christ in your life and through your life. Then He said so that we could live, He could live through us. So God sent His Son to us. We receive to be with us, cultivate, and so He could live through us. That's an activate. That's an act of surrender. That's an ongoing act of healing my life to Him. So what are some of the things that you and I can do that can cultivate um, an environment, cultivate an atmosphere within our lives that will be attractive to the Holy Spirit working in us and through us? And uh, that's what I actually want to talk on. So um, it's not just experiencing the power of God and we need the power of God. But it's learning to cultivate his activity, learning to fellowship with the Holy Spirit, learning to allow him to work in and through us. All right. So, number one, not necessarily in this order. Walk in forgiveness. Cultivate a lifestyle of forgiveness. I encourage you. It's the single biggest factor that will block the work and the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is what forgiveness means. To grant free pardon of any offense, debt, or wrongdoing 
never expected anything back in return to give up all claims and rights to hold on to it. God granted complete forgiveness and it was totally free. Jesus paid the price, not us. And so we got to continue, even if we need to ask, Lord, teach me how to forgive. Teach me how to let go. Unforgiveness is a huge issue. It really is. It's very subtle as well. It will hold us in bondage. In Matthew 18, Jesus talks about it. It will lock us down. It will hold you in place. It's designed to hold you back, to lock you into a stronghold in a way of thinking. That's what unforgiveness does. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul says, I've forgiven you in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are aware of his schemes. So we can see it's the devil's schemes. So when we don't forgive, it's like we partner with him. That's why it's so serious, because we block the promises of God and we begin to partner with him. We're actually saying, all right, I'm going to partner with the devil's works, the devil's schemes. And it's like he begins to strap us down and he refuses to let us go forward. Some of the fruits of unforgiveness. If you have to give it towards others, what begins to slowly breed in our lives over a period of time, it can be hatred, bitterness, suspicion, resentment, envy, jealousy, murder. And the fruits of unforgiveness towards God are doubt and unbelief and rebellion. Um, I'm just being honest with you. I don't know how people can hold God be unforgiving towards God, but I understand that some people do. I've had to work through, help people work through it. And then the fruits of unforgiveness towards yourself is guilt, condemnation, unworthiness, shame, self-hatred, embarrassment, suicide. That's what unforgiveness, if left unchecked, will fester in our lives. And so sometimes something happens and then we don't forgive, and over a period of time, that emotion begins to go away, but the unforgiveness is still there, unfortunately. And at, over a period of time, things begin to work in our lives that are not good. And the consequences of unforgiveness is poor health, negative emotions, broken relationships, broken fellowship with God. And we can also open up our lives to the demonic realm. So I'm encouraging you, learn to walk in forgiveness. And closely linked with unforgiveness is the word offense. Many people, unfortunately, don't know how to deal with the offense that comes their way. That word offense in the New Testament is a word called scandalon. That's the little bait that you put in a trap to trap an animal to come in and grab the bait. And as they grab the bait, the cage falls on them, they're trapped. That's what it actually means. So there's, it's like the bait of Satan comes. We grab it. We take hold of this offense. And then we get trapped. We get trapped in it. And it's uh, amazing for me to see that in Mark chapter, I think it's Mark chapter 6 verse, I can't remember, verse somewhere, Mark 6, 3. That's right. Where it says when Jesus went to his own hometown, the Bible says they took offense at him. And he could not do many miracles there. He could only heal a few people. That's what the combination of the un unforgiveness and offense, because they're closely associated, begins to stop the work of God in our life. So I encourage you, forgive. Forgive one another. Forgive your spouses. Forgive your husbands. Forgive your wives. Forgive your kids. Forgive your leaders. Learn to walk in it. I encourage you, because offense will come. Uh, it will test us, and we need to learn to walk in it. We all go through it, trust me. But the Lord is there. He will help us. So learn to walk in unforgiveness. In forgiveness, I beg your pardon. In forgiveness, not unforgiveness. <laughs> Number two, or B, or everyone. Learn to walk in humility. How do I do that? How do I learn to cultivate a lifestyle of humility? Well, start by cultivating a lifestyle of worship and praise. In our house, we often put on in the background just some praise and worship. So as you walk around the house, whatever you're doing, every now and then I find myself singing along with the song. So what it does is it keeps my heart in the right place, in the right attitude with the Lord. 
because I find myself just naturally worshiping along with the song and it's wonderful so cultivate that lifestyle of worship and praise and it always reminds us of who he is he's the Lord he really is also walking walking in humility cultivate a lifestyle of honor honoring God honoring others honoring your leaders I encourage you honor as you've heard many people say is the vehicle that God uses for your inheritance in other words children honor your mom and dad so that it may go well with you when they do they walk in the inheritance that the parents want to pass on to the children and it's like that with them as we learn to honor our leaders we learn to honor one another give honor where honor is due I encourage you Romans 12 is full of that honor so cultivate a lifestyle of honor and then cultivate a lifestyle of gratitude and generosity gratitude that keeps my heart in the right place when I love gratitude when I live a lifestyle of gratitude we have a uh, wonderful holiday in America it's called Thanksgiving as many of you are aware and um, so about two years ago my wife came up with this wonderful idea that we would put a jar in our kitchen and she put a label on it called the gratitude jar so as the year goes by, whatever happens, even little things in our lives, we just write on a piece of paper and we put it in the gratitude jar. Because I found sometimes as you reflect back on the year, you actually forget some of the things that God did, even the small things. And so then at Thanksgiving, we pull all these out and we sit there and we say, oh, remember this. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Lord, for this. And I just thought it was a wonderful idea, the gratitude jar. So cultivate a lifestyle of gratitude and generosity. Your father is exceedingly generous, richly generous, overabundantly generous towards us. And so as we cultivate that lifestyle, it invites the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Number C, keep short accounts. I encourage you. Short accounts with God and short accounts with people. Keep short accounts. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. In other words, begin to resolve it and sort it out. Don't go to bed with some stuff festering inside of you. That's not helpful. In the morning you wake up, you think it's gone, but it's not gone. It's still there. So I encourage you, short accounts. Well, however you can do that, keep short accounts. In other words, stay updated with God and with people. Number D or four, whatever you want to call it. Remain and abide in the word. I encourage you. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Dwell in you richly. John 15.7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. The word of God is powerful, people. We have to understand that. Uh, I think it's 1 Thessalonians. Hmm, I don't want to misquote it. Where it says that when we believe the word of God, when we receive the Word of God as the Word of God and we believe it, there's an activity, a work that takes place in us. See, it's only the Word of God under the power of the Spirit that can adjust my attitudes, that can change my way of thinking. That's why we are called to re renew our mind. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God that comes. It's alive. It's active. It's a double-edged sword. It penetrates deep down inside of us. So as we learn to remain or abide in the word whatever that means for you i'm not telling you how much each day or anything that's for you to walk through and discover with the lord but get in the word however what that means to you allow the word of god to come to you be rich to you allow the word of god to adjust you allow the word of god to renew your mind allow the word of god to do bring the conviction if that is needed allow the word of god to strengthen you allow the word of god to show you the promises of god for you that's what we desperately need to get in the Word of God. I just believe in the future, in the near future, truth is under such attack. We need to know the truth of God. We need to know what we stand for and what we believe. We need to know that because there's such attack on truth out in the world. So let the word of God dwell in you richly. I encourage you. Next one. Persist in prayer. Persist in prayer. It's, encouraged, it's incredible that God would encourage us to come to him and speak to him. 
right through. Even Jesus said in uh, uh, Mark 7, ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will open. Seek and you'll find. In Luke 11, Jesus tells this amazing parable. First of all, he's busy praying. So the disciples come to him and say, teach us to pray because they see him pray. And then he says, and then he gives them what we call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who are in heaven, you know it. And then goes straight into a parable. And in that parable, it's about somebody that comes to his friend's house at midnight and asks his friend for a loaf of bread. But his friend, the door who's he knocked on, doesn't have what this guy needs. So he says, hang on, let me go to my friend and ask him to give me something that I can give to you. And Jesus says, I say to you, ask. And will be given, knock and you'll find, seek and you'll find. Then he says, if you who are earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give you the Holy Spirit when you ask him? That's the whole essence of prayer. That we open up our heart and our lives to his working in us. And so when we don't know what we need sometimes, when we can't help other people because we don't have what they need, we get on our knees and we start praying. And the Holy Spirit begins to come and give us something or reveal something or give us a word to encourage us. That's the whole point of prayer. Prayer doesn't twist God's arm. Prayer gets our heart right with God. That's what it does. It gets us in the right communion. So I encourage you, persist in prayer. Don't back off in prayer. During this time of lockdown was a wonderful time for people just to spend a little bit more time with him, a little bit more time in the Word or whatever the case is. And um, yeah, so I encourage you. All right. I trust this is helpful for you. Next one. Embrace and cultivate fellowship. Embrace and cultivate fellowship. There are 52 or 54 one another's in the New Testament. We are not an island. We cannot enter into the things of God. We, are no, we will never enter into the things of God, just me and Jesus. It doesn't happen that way. It's in community, it's through community, and it's by community. So I encourage you, embrace and cultivate fellowship. Don't wait for somebody to reach out to you. Reach out to them to encourage them, phone them, text, email. That's what I would encourage you to do. So cultivate that fellowship. Now that things are opening up, we can begin to meet hopefully face to face. There's nothing like meeting together and be able to hug somebody or shake their hand or whatever the case is. But embrace and cultivate fellowship. Next one, be aggressive. Be aggressive towards the enemy. Don't flirt with him. I encourage you. We will lose. Don't flirt with him. Be aggressive towards the enemy as best as you know how. He is around, he's lurking, looking for people to devour. 1 Peter 5 tells us that. He's a wily, wily, he's been around many years, very deceptive. So don't flirt with him, I encourage you, be very aggressive towards the lies of the enemy, the works of the enemy. Just, yeah, be aggressive. There's a lot I can say in there, but I don't want to know. Okay, next one. Cultivate a bridal tongue. James 3, don't have time to read it, but I encourage you, go read James 3. There's a lot about the power of the tongue there. You see, the words we speak, they are vehicles. They are containers. And I actually have something here. Where is it? There it is, yeah. About words. Words are containers. They carry faith or fear, belief or doubt, conviction or confusion. They are seeds. Words are seeds. They will always produce after the kind. The words you speak are seeds. Just as sure as they are planted, you can be equally sure that a harvest will follow. The words locate us. What I mean by that? They begin to reveal actually what's inside of us. That's what they do. And that's not a negative. That's just a reality. That's all it is. And then we can take it to the Lord. The words fix landmarks in our lives. In other words, the words spoken yesterday make life what it is today. That's why I encourage you, cultivate a bridal tongue. Think it through before we speak or before we answer. It's a reflection of what's in our heart. Jesus said that. The words set the atmosphere within your life, 
within your home life, within your marriage, within your family. The atmosphere is a product of words. That's what it is. And so I encourage you, cultivate it. So, cultivate a bridal tongue. I don't know how else to put that. That's the best I could think of it. Okay. So cultivate a bridal tongue. Philippians 2, 12 and 4, 12 to 14 says there, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act and do according to his good works. And the very next work says, the very next verse says this, do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless, pure children of God. So you can see how Paul has tied the working out of a salvation, and as God is working in us, to what comes out of our mouth. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Next one, cultivate a faith tongue. A biblical confession. 2 Corinthians 4.12 says, I believe, therefore I spoke. Let your heart speak. Let your heart, what's inside your heart, the promises begin to come out of your mouth. Hebrews 11.3 one says, Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Hebrews 4.14 says, Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So cultivate a faith tongue. I encourage you, cultivate a faith tongue. Sorry, my battery is busy running flat. I don't know why. Hopefully we get through this. Two more. Then follow the life. Whatever brings life to you, whatever you feel brings life to you, follow that life. Cultivate that life. Because that's what's edifying you. That's what's bringing life to you. That's what's strengthening you. That's what's invigorating you. And then develop an ear to his voice. I mean, we could speak on that a lot. Just develop an ear to his voice. His voice is very, very important in our lives. Extremely important in our life, his voice. We can't live our Christian lives without his voice. And so learn to develop an ear to his voice. So I just found these things come out of my own life. I'm not saying I get them right all the time. But I just found this begins to create an environment that attracts the Holy Spirit's activity and allows Him to work in me, through me, to empower me, to establish deep wells within me so I can learn to live from those deep wells. And it is a lifestyle. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is fruit. It takes a while. And uh, because whatever the anointing, we desperately need the anointing of God. We need the anointing of God in our lives, and I've chatted a bit about that. But we can undo all the work that God does under the anointing when we don't allow the Spirit of God to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, which takes a while. But that's the heart of God, that we may give glory to Him, that we may show forth who our Father is, who this blessed Savior is. So I trust this encourages you guys there in British Columbia. And I uh, know we pray for you. Um, yeah, and we hope to see you soon. So I wonder if I could just quickly pray for you and then I'll hand over to whoever's going to take over here. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for these wonderful people in that great nation of Canada. Thank you for who they are in you. Thank you for your work and their lives and through their lives. Lord, for those in this time that we've been locked down, they just feel like they've lost a bit of heart. I ask you, Father, to strengthen them by your Spirit. Encourage them, Lord. Encourage them, I pray. Lord, may your blessing, may your goodness, may your grace, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with his precious people. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings. Great being with you guys.